Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Community Platform. Long time ago, if you were happy, people may say that you were gay. However, that word has now picked up some other connotation, very much based on your sexuality. There are other words which have picked up and have been groomed in a certain way. So when we talk about jihad or the veil or a sharia, there are some pretty negative connotations. Add to that, uh, the latest word, of course, is Khilafa or Khilafat. Mention that word and terrible blood-curdling images can pass in your imagination. But what does that word mean? How do we as Muslims and non-Muslims look at that word? Today, we're delighted to have two people who have some knowledge. Let's ask them what that word means. We also have a small audience and hope that they will grill two of my panelists today. So let's welcome to our, our panelists. Asalaamu Alaikum Mazabai. Wa Alaikum Asalaamu Alaikum. It's been a long time. Good to have you back. It, ha it has, yes. It nice has. to be back. I thought you left us for. No, no, always here. It's good to have you back. And of course, Sharif, Asalaamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum Asalaamu And uh, you are, of course, um, quite frequently with us. It's good to have you here. Okay. I'm quite concerned that one of our co hosts is in the audience. I'm not too sure what he's up to, but uh, I'm sure he's got a question or two for us. Asalaamu Alaikum Majid. It's good to have you here. It's good to have you here. Sharif, can I start with you? What does this word mean? What does Khilafat really mean? How yeah. do we understand that? Muslims as well as non-Muslims. Yeah. I think the uh, best way to explain it is from the hadith of the Prophet which is found in Sahih Muslim. Uh, where the Prophet he said that for the children of Israel, their politics were performed by their prophets. Every time their prophet passed away, another prophet was placed above them. And then the Prophet said, but there will be no more prophets after me. Instead, there will be khulafa, khalifas and they'll number many. So what the Prophet is explaining is that one of the roles of the Anbiya, of the Prophet and the Prophets, was that of politics, looking after the affairs of the people. And that that particular aspect of the role will continue even after prophethood, although the revelations will stop. So that looking after the affairs, the politics aspects of it, will continue with the Khalifas. This is what the Prophet himself said. And the Sahaba, they asked, well, what do you order us to do? And they said, or the Prophet said, uh, give them the bay'ah, which means the Pledge of Allegiance, one after the other. So we can understand that this role of political leadership, which now resides with people, with uh, any of the Khalifas, who are appointed uh, and selected via the people themselves, by the Ummah themselves, that they are there in order to ensure that the application of the Sharia is managed and that people's affairs are looked after. Okay, so it all seems that it is a requirement, from my understanding, from what you've just said, it's almost that it is a requirement. Well, yeah, and it's not something which is uh, unusual, because this is what the classical scholars have said. Like a very famous scholar, his name was Imam Marwadi, he wrote a book called Al-Ahkam al-Sultaniyya. He talked about how it is a wajib, it's an obligation to establish a khalifa. Imam Jawaini, who was a teacher of Imam Ghazali, mentioned it. Imam Ghazali himself mentioned it. You know, other scholars from different madahibs right across, they all agreed it was something that they had ijma upon, consensus upon, that the appointment of a khalif and the establishment of a khilaf, an Islamic state, is an obligation uh, for all Muslims to, to ensure that, that it manifests and comes about. Mazabai, from what uh, Sharif is explaining, seems as almost that it's, it's a requirement, you know. So, where did we go wrong? Where did this slip up? How has this been misunderstood? Because you mentioned Khalifa today, and I have these terrible images of ch heads being chopped off, bombs going off. Um, it's, uh, it's necessary because uh, the Khilafah is the practical manifestation of Islam, because otherwise Islam is just a theory and ideas. But it's the Khilafah which practically brings Islam alive, which is why Islam was very successful in history, and it is the reason why Islam spread so rapidly from a village in Medina all the way to the west coast of Africa uh, because Islamic the Khilafah was able to dispense justice and people were able to experience Islam in a real way so the Khilafah amongst the Muslims for centuries had a very warm feeling in their hearts and, and a very warm attachment they had to it so even when the Khilafah was being destroyed you know places as far afield as India the people in India rose up, they said, no, we can't live without this. And even when the Khilafah was destroyed, the, the ulama convened in Cairo to say, how are we going to conduct Salatul Jum'ah? 
because until uh, at that point uh, the, the Khalifa was mentioned in the, the Jum'ah prayers, so the, the ulama met. So yes, up until a point in time in history, the Muslims were very, uh, had a warm feelings towards the term Khilafa. And um, even the non-Muslims, which inshallah, as the show progresses, I'll, I'll give you one or two quotes mm -hmm. of what non-Muslims had to say about it. But we live in a, a very uh, politicized climate right now. And they are putting words in, and they are coming out the other end with completely different connotations. So words which have one meaning to the Muslims, the media has re-engineered these words to mean something totally different. But so it's not just non-Muslim as Dubai, is it? I mean, even Muslims themselves, I mean, Muslims themselves would look at this word with worry. Yes. In, in because the if you think what's happening in Iraq, what's happening in Syria, you know, we're worried. Yes, in the modern time, because these words are being churned out by the media, and they're not just focusing on the non-Muslims, anybody who watches the media are affected by this. So now, Khilafah has suddenly become a term which is meant to be barbaric, it's meant to be brutal, it's meant to be austere, it's meant to be uh, sectarian. All the negative things you can think about, you can put them all in, and this is what the media is now presenting, this is a Khilafah. And they've done this with other terms. So for example, um, to Muslims, jihad was something, you know, something to repel oppression, something to remove oppression. But now, jihad in the uh, vocabulary today is synonymous with terrorism. Mm -hmm. So you won't get Muslims using the word jihad inside the masjid or outside the masjid. Mm -hmm. Even with cer certain terms like polygamy, it is like you can't use those terms and people try and apologize for that. Mm -hmm. And the sharia itself, sharia has now become a, a negative term. So the media has done, uh, 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 from their point of view, a very good job in doing a makeover of Islam. Let's take this call. Let's take this call. Assalamu alaikum, brother from London, I believe. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Ji. Uh, I'd like to make a quick uh, question, actually, sister. Jazakallah uh, khair for having me on. Yes, go ahead. <coughs> um, basically, uh, as the brother already mentioned, it is an obligation to have the Islamic State. But I would actually have to want to ask a question, which is that not seeing all the negative images that's coming up from this particular area, um, should the Muslim and non-Muslim fear the Khilafah? And also, what would the Khilafah offer the Muslims and the non-Muslim? Uh, I'd like to ask both of your panelists. Very interesting question. Sharif, do you want to take that question? Yeah, uh, I think the issue about fear and uh, as Muzavai has mentioned about how they have tried to create this narrative that whenever anyone talks about Khilafah or Sharia that somehow it's akin to violence, instability and terrorism and that's quite far away from what the historical aspect of the Khilafah was and as I mentioned previously the fact that the Prophet ﷺ himself said this is one of the roles of the Anbiya yeah, not of the revelation, but of looking after the affairs of the people is going to become regards to the Khalifas. So in that context, the manifestation of the justice, the mercy of Islam is manifested in a society where you have governance, good governance as well. And that good governance is going to come by following the principles of Islam, which by definition means Khilafah. And we know historically when Muslims did this and established Islam, non-Muslims sought refuge to the Muslim world. Yeah? So there's an example of this that, you know, after the persecution of the Jews uh, or the, in Spain and in other parts of Europe, one rabbi, famous letter of a rabbi, he said, uh, and it's reported in the book, Constantinople, he said, here in the, land of the lands of the Turks, we have nothing to complain of. We possess great fortunes, much gold and silver are in our hands. We are not oppressed with heavy taxes and our commerce is free and unhindered. Rich are the fruits of the earth, everything is cheap and every one of us lives in peace and freedom. So he's talking about living in the capital city of the Islamic State, the Khilafah, Istanbul at the time. How, how it was responded to there. So the oppression, the difficulties that we see around the world, so it's not just in the Muslim world. You know, we've seen these you know, massive economic crisis within the West. We have seen poverty that ravages the third world. We've seen exploitative practices that occurs with you know, big powerful governments against weaker nations. All of these things, you've got an alternative regards to Islam and that's what the Khilafah will represent. That sounds wonderful. Uh, you, just very quickly, if you want to respond to that, I mean, there are a million questions in my mind. What you've just said sounds perfect. But my worry would be, who's leading on that? Who's actually, you know, where would the accountability be? And, and those are some of the questions that I would like to ask. Do you want to respond to no, that? No, just to add on from what Sharif actually mentioned about, because today the media has done a wonderful job to conflate 
you know, uh, the Muslims, and not just the Muslims, the world's dislike for the Zionist state and to conflate that with anti-Semitism because the Jews never felt safer anywhere other than under the rule of the Muslims. And that was from the early days of the Khilafah Rashida towards the 14th, 15th century from which Sharif just brought that quote from to, towards you even later on. I mean, in the 15th century when the Jews were expelled from Spain, they found a home in the heart of the Khilafah state, in the heart, in the capital of the Islamic State in Istanbul. Mm. If you look at the early on, in the time of the Khilafah Rashida, when a, a Jew stole the shield of Ali radiallahu mm. anhu, he took him to an ordinary court to have be to be adjudicated to have that matter adjudicated, and the Jew ruled in the sorry the judge ruled in the favor of the Jew because the evidence provided by Ali radiallahu anhu didn't come up to the standard required. That's, so, that's wonderful and history. What, one, wonderful. one thing to remember is that was not long after Ghazwa Khandak, the, 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 the difficulties they had with the Jews, the treachery at Ghazwa Khandak, but even the dislike and the history which took place between the Muslims of Jews did not color the way justice was dispensed to the minorities. And that's why Islam was successful. Absolutely. We're going to come back to question from our young people. We're going to take this call. Brother Waqar from Bradford, Salaamu Alaikum. Alaikum Salaam. Uh, uh, so I've got a really quick question, mashallah, really good topic. Uh, why is it the case that the ulema of Bradford, for example, uh, sorry, uh, Pakistan, like uh, Dr. Taul Qadri, who's a really big scholar, is calling for jamuriyat or democracy. Why is it the case that the big scholars in the world are not behind here. Uh, it seems like his Tahrir. Could you maybe uh, expand on the argument? Because I believe in Khilafah. It's an amazing uh, thing from our history. That's our history. Jamuriyat is in our history. Why is it the case that the ulema are certainly calling for democracy in the Muslim world? Maybe you can expand on that, please. Thank you for the question. We'll try to do our best. If you want to respond, both of you, but very quickly, because I can see my young people. Uh, wanting to question. Yeah, very, very briefly, I mean, with all respect to the ulama, you know, if an alim has studied uh, uh, tajweed of the Quran, he's an expert on tajweed. That does not give him the license now to speak about ilmul hadith. If a scholar is uh, 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 qualified on the issue of ilmul hadith, that doesn't qualify him to talk about uh, uh, economics or even to make ijtihad. If a, if a, if a scholar is uh, uh, qualified in a particular area, that's where his expertise is. You can go to any major Dar al in the world today, I don't think many of them study politics. I don't think many of them study international relations. So they don't have that expertise and because of that they make many mistakes when it comes to the issue of politics, current affairs, international relations and they feel that they can make a judgment on that and sometimes they are not qualified of making judgments on that. Yeah, Do you want a quick to yeah to that? I think uh, obviously without passing any judgments on specific imams and ulama whom we respect anyway. Uh, what we have to understand is what Muzza said, which is that we live within over 90 years without an Islamic state. It has been outside of our curriculum, so we've never really studied it. It's not been uh, a topic of discussion amongst our masajids. It's not been a topic of discussion amongst, uh, you know, the madrasa system. Now what we're facing is headline news, Islamic state, headline news, Khilafah, BBC, Sky News, ITV, this is headline news. Suddenly now that discussion which may have seen distant past of 90 years ago is now here today. And that's why our Imams and Ulema have to now reassess and relearn these things. Go back to our history, go back to our Islamic text. There are plenty of books on this subject matter mm -hmm. and bring it forward. And mm -hmm. it's important. And it's important that we don't always frame our discussions of politics with what appeases Western liberal secular values, which is what tends to happen. So we have to talk about Isla politics in the context of democracy, freedom, or nation states. We need to break these terms and look at what Islam talks about in terms of politics. Well put. I know that you young people have lots of questions. Grill them. Sorry. Bye, Bye Islam. My name is Kasim. I'm from uh, Rochdale. Um, I've got a question for Brother Sharif. Um, uh, you discussed how um, non-Muslims um, uh, lived a relative uh, peace and prosperity in the history of the Islamic State and um, they, they uh, had justice that they experienced but do they write in the, in the modern kind of political context do they, do they rights as citizens extend to different elements of the state such as um, the economic system such as for example uh, the political uh, the ruling system for example would a non-Muslim be able to uh, be in a position of ruling um, so do they, do they have the same rights as uh, Muslims in the, in the state? Yeah, it's a good question. I think the first thing is uh, to mention 
is that when it comes to the, the, the concept of citizenship in Islam, citizenship is understood as people's residencies. So where do they reside? So whether they're Muslim or non-Muslim, if they reside under the authority of Islam and therefore the Khilafah, they are citizens of the Islamic State. And as such, they're considered equal citizens with some exemptions in regards to this. So therefore, non-Muslims and Muslims will have access, the same access to justice, the same access to economic rights, the same access to the Beit al the state treasury within Islam. All these things are considered equal. Where there may be distinctions is related to beliefs. So for example, the obligation to pray is conditional for a person to accept a belief in Islam. So that's not going to be placed upon non-Muslims, whereas, whereas it's placed upon Muslims. Similarly, non-Muslims have their rights to their own court system when it comes to their marriage, their divorce, their own religious practices. And in fact, that was something that was established within the time of the Prophet and the Khulifa al Rashidin. Something which, when Muslims today in Britain, 21st century, talk about having some aspects of Sharia in terms of family law, in terms of marriage and divorce, they are denied. Islam allowed Christians and Jews and Hindus and others as well to have their own court systems when it comes to their own matters of religious or personal law. So that's in terms of how they are. In terms of certain specific roles like engagement in politics, definitely they're allowed to engage in politics, call and ask for their rights. But there are certain areas that obviously there are going to be natural restrictions. Like for example, if I wanted to become an MP, I would have to make an oath of allegiance to the Queen and to the Constitution, or to the unwritten Constitution. I have to make a shahada to these things. So similarly, if a person wanted to get into the ruling position within Islam, he also has to make an oath or a shahada. And that shahada is obviously to that there is none worthy of worship except Allah, and that the Muhammad Sallam is the messenger of Allah. And therefore, he is a person who is going to administer the justice of Islam because he believes in it as well. Good question. Anyone else? Assalamu alaikum. Well, my name is Dudu, and I'm from Rochelle, so I've got a question for Brother Muzzar. So in terms of sectarianism, as you can see, it's rife now within the Middle East where most are ruling, I think it's either dictatorships or secular liberal values that are upon the Muslim world. So when it comes to the term of the Kilava, how would that deal with sectarianism within the Muslim world if it was to come about? Again? Okay, good, good question. Um, sectarian, sectarianism, or for another word, differences and disputes amongst the Muslims um, is nothing new. And to be quite honest, it's been there since almost the, the, the time of Khilafah Rashida. We know about the disputes with Ali radiallahu an and Muawiyah. So disputes have occurred from way back. What is interesting is that in the Islamic history, unlike the European history, it's not, been, it's not the same in the sense that we've been uh, in perpetual conflict. So if you look at European history, the Protestants and the Catholics, they fought, you know, they were uh, hammer and nail after one another centuries all the history is colored with that. So Guy Fawkes is to do with that, you know. Henry VIII, when he left, uh, created the Church of England, is because of the dispute. And there's many wars uh, uh, that took place in Europe. Fred Halliday, professor, the late Professor uh, Fred Halliday of London School of Economics, when the Americans invaded into Iraq, and then the whole Sunni-Shia conflict uh, uh, resulted in bloodshed, he commented, he goes, what is... Uh, I can't remember the exact word, but he said, what is strange about the, or what is unusual about the dispute amongst the Sunnis and Shia is the absence of violence. Mm -hmm. Sunnis and Shias have lived together for 1300, 1400 years without bloodshed. The only bloodshed that ha has occurred is now in the modern era with the secular division of the land and with the colonialist occupation of the land and all the black operation, all the dirty tricks that have been going on, this has created a, a, a sectarian nightmare. But actually when Islam was there, Islam was able to manage the different groupings of the Muslims as a one brotherhood. Because the Khilafah state is not a sectarian state. It, it, it doesn't align itself to any sectarian grouping. It is an Islamic state for all Muslims. So Islam has a very good track record in creating harmony, not just, I mean, I know you're talking about sectarianism, but not just amongst the various groupings amongst the Muslims, but even the non-Muslims were at home in the Khilafah state and allied, its, uh, and, uh, allied themselves with the Khilafah state. You know, we talked about the Jews previously. We talk about Syria today, you know, with what's going on in Syria. When Khalid bin Walid and the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, liberated Syria, there was a, a period of time in history at that particular juncture where they were unable to defend some of the non-Muslims. And first time in history and unknown to people of that era, 
the Khilafah state returned their taxes back to the Jews and the Christians because they were unable to defend them. And the Jews who were in Homs, the Jews who were in Homs, their rabbi said, we will lock the doors and we will protect this city from the Romans and we will defend it until you come back and rule over us again. SubhanAllah. So even the Jews had more trust with the rule of the Muslims than they had the rules of the Romans. So you can forget what the Muslims would have thought. If the non-Muslims were happy to live under Sharia law, then you know all these modern disputes that the West tried to create, like, oh, how can a Sunni live with a Shia? Well, we've done that for 1400 years. You don't need to tell us how, we know how. <clears throat> yes, anything else, Majid? Yeah, just um, a question for Brother Mazur. You talked about um, the Khilafah state in the past, um, and you've also talked about how this word now is being muddied currently by the media. I think what you're referring to is uh, the situation in Iraq where there has been a declaration of a, of a Khilafah state. They call themselves um, a state which is based on Islam. They call ISIS and they were called ISIL and now they call IS now. So very conveniently they changed their name to Islamic State. If you'd like to just comment upon that because I think that is what, it, in my view, is the, is the backdrop to this discussion today. That there's a word which has been, uh, it's had a glorious history Muslims have always revered this and have always tried to work towards this ideal and now we have a movement in place in Iraq which is declaring itself as a state uh, based on Islam and at the same time is involved in stuff like beheadings, uh, the f what we hear about whether it's true or not, the forced conversion of non-Muslims to Islam, the capturing of women from tribes, uh, killing their menfolk and basically taking them as war booty. So if you'd like to comment upon that because I think this is what most of us are scared about today, as in, right, okay, this word, shall I talk about Khilafana or is it best to remain silent? Because if I talk about it, for example, if I carry an Islamic flag today, which has the kalim on it, a black flag with a white kalima written on it, and maybe I have that inside an uh, Islamic society, inside a college or a university fair, whatever, um, you know, I might be labeled as an extremist, and I may have MI5 knocking on my doors, saying that you have some sort of links to, you know, uh, radical movements. If you'd like to comment upon that, please. That's a very long question. It's but, a very uh, long question. I'll try and give a short answer. Question. I'll try and give a short <laughs> answer. Um, ISIS or ISIL or IS, mm -hmm. whatever what they're being referred to at the moment, ISIS, Islamic State. The thing is, it's a, it's a militant group which has imposed itself on that region. And that is not what an Islamic State is. The Islamic State doesn't, is not a group which imposes itself on other people. Rather, it is, a, it is a movement which will seek the consent of the people to rule over them. So there's an element of consent there which doesn't exist here, number one. Number two, the thing is, the IS is a militant group. Now to call them a state, they, forget calling them an Islamic state, they don't even have a state. They don't have a, a state established, let alone an Islamic state. And it's interesting why the media likes to paint the IS as some sort of a state. Whereas the same situation is existing in Somalia. You've got militant groups running around there with guns and enforcing their will, forcing their will on other people. But no media or no politician has labeled those militant groups to have established the state. They say it's a failed state. It's a stateless area. It's, it's chaos. The same situation exists in Iraq. It is chaotic because of what America did in 2003 and people are you know, still living off, living that nightmare today. The reason they are accepting this as an Islamic state is because for the West it fulfills their propaganda coup in order to demonize this term of Islam. And what you also, also added about the flag, the flag, the black flag with the white kalima doesn't belong to any group, doesn't belong to any people. It is the flag of Islam, it is the flag of the Prophet wasallam, and belongs to all Muslims. And nobody can demonize that and we should not allow that to be demonized and we should actually display it and say no, nobody has copyrighted this flag. Well, let's take this one more call. Um, thank you for that, uh, Mazhar Bhai. Muhammad Ashraf from Manchester. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Uh, wa alaikum, salam. Gee, you have a question? You have a statement? Yeah, what? yeah. can I just make, would it, would it be possible if I could make two points? You certainly can, as long as they're quick, brother. So they, 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 they are. I think that during the, if you'll probably recall, your esteemed guests will recall that during the time of the Ottomans, you also had the great... Uh, Alhamdulillah, rulers, the Mughal rulers over in India who were the followers of classical Islam who were absolutely tolerant and you had, you know, the, the majority of people living during the Mughal times were followers of the Hindu faith, the Sikh faith, etc., who had, uh, you know, uh, uh, full rights, equality before the law, etc., etc. I think we must also remember that as well. Um, and uh, 
that's the first point I'd like to make. Uh, the second point, um, I think some of the uh, uh, some of the uh, some people may not want to hear this, but I think during the time of the Ottomans, there was treachery by certain uh, uh, Muslims, followers of certain sects, who fought with the uh, British and the French to, to destroy the Khalifa. And now those same sects are crying out, Khalifa, Khalifa, we want the return of the Khalifa, this, that, the other. I think people forget that. And I, I, without naming names, I think we know who those people are. And we need to also remember that this is also, the problems we have in the Middle East is also as a result of Arab nationalism, I'm afraid to say. Um, and, and, you know, it is, that is a direct result. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Jazakallah khair. That was Brother Mohammed Aisha from Manchester. Uh, Sharif, and I think from a historical perspective, the word Khalafa had a beautiful meaning. It was just, just not for the Muslim, but for all communities. And it has been politicized. But the fact is, we know that it's been politicized. We, we, we always seem to know the problem. We never seem to be looking for the solution. Well, the solution would be to decouple the discussion of Khilafa from what the West tries to paint it with. The, but even you know, talking about the particular problem, I think there also is another aspect of the problem. What is the concern that Western liberal states have with regards to Khilafa? Because you have to realize that, you know, in, you know, a hundred years ago, uh, we saw, you know, it's the hundred year World War One anniversary. Mm -hmm. And we saw the fact that this was the last time the Ottoman states was involved, you know, on the world scene primarily. And what you found that that period of time saw a greater aggression against the Muslim world, occupation, imperialism, uh, colonization of the Muslim world. This was when uh, Balfour Declaration, Lord Balfour made the declaration of the creation of the State of Israel in 1917. This is when we had the Sykes-Peacock Agreement where they split up the Muslim nations into different parts and countries, made them small little weak states. This is where they started to fund certain Arab groups to make rebellion against the Ottoman state, against the Khilafah. So you see all of this, these problems that occurred. Now why did they do this? They did this because they recognized that the Muslim world, you know, strategically in terms of its geopolitical location, in terms of its resources, in terms of its number of people, in terms of its faith, in terms of the fact that it offers an alternative political vision, all of these things demonstrate that it offers something different mm -hmm. to the current world political order. And they recognize that the Muslim world are very close now to actually realizing this ambition of establishing Islamic State. ISIS, they are a false, uh, false declaration. Everybody pretty much has agreed upon that. Most of the ulema, most of the scholars, most of the movements out there, they have distanced themselves. They said they, they are incorrect and wrong. But the sentiments of Islam and Muslims are more and more towards the political order of Islam. The sentiments are more towards unity. Okay. And they recognize that what this would mean is that the Muslim world would be borderless in the Muslim world. That 70% of the known oil resources would be shared amongst the Muslims. It wouldn't be you know, harvested or refined by Western corporations. 50% of the world's gas resources. So they recognize that there is a political threat from the unity of the Muslims under an alternative Islamic almost, system. It almost feels like a clash of civilization. We'll come back to that. But I think Brother Waqar is back. Salaam alaikum, Brother. Salaam alaikum. I'm listening to the discussion. Thank you so much for such a good great Pleasure, debate. sir. Pleasure. Uh, so I've got a question. I think it was Mother Brother who was answering the sectarian question. Uh, we have had sectarian differences in Islam. We don't have to really go into them. But a great example is when Salahuddin fought against the Fatimite state in Egypt, which was predominantly Ismailis or Shia, so we have had it, we, let's not say it's all candies and fluffle, we never had Shia versus uh, Sunni or El Sunnah of Al Jamaat because it's an Aqidah Maslah and whenever it has been, the ulimas have always said that, you know, it has to be Sunni ruling and I'm sure that's one of the criteria to be a Khalif. And I've got a really quick question, that was a comment and this is the question. So why is it the case that uh, Certain people are saying that Khilafa can come and the Khalif can either be Shia or Sunni, it doesn't matter as long as, uh, you know, the Aqidah aspect is there. But the Islamic opinion has to be that he has to be a Sunni because I am a Sunni. Um, uh, the Aqidah of Shia differs with my Aqidah. Uh, what is the opinion of the panelists in regards to the 
caliph itself should he have a Islamic opinion? Because Salahuddin Ayyubi did have a Islamic opinion. He, he opened Sufi darbars and so forth. So let's not say that he can be Shia so forth. Could you maybe answer the question? Please? Thank you. Jazakallah khair. We'll do our best. Can I, yeah, quickly just really that? quickly. The Ismailis, even the Shia, as we, as we know today, even they consider them kuffar uh, and non-Muslims. That's firstly. Secondly is that uh, what was interesting is the Fatimid Khilafah was a rival Khilafah to the main Khalif, which was in Baghdad. And they were helping the Crusaders to provide supply lines so that they stocked up within the occupation of Palestine at the time. So Salahuddin al-Ayyubi, rahimahullah, he knew that the problem was a political problem. It's not a sectarian one. It was a case of unifying the Muslims. It was a case of uh, preventing the, the, the Crusaders from having political and, uh, and strategic support so that they could perpetuate the occupation within Jerusalem. And that's why he fought against them. Uh, and he, he established that. But what's interesting is that the Khalifas in the past, like for example, during the time of Imam Ghazali, they never used to adopt upon the specifics of Islam. So they dropped it upon the general aqidah of Islam. But they didn't adopt upon the specifics. And Imam Ghazali, he, he wrote a book called al Faisal Tafrika, where he discussed what are the key criteria of a Muslim and what are those things which are branches where people have differed over or even if the differences in the Aqidah in the branches are invalid they still don't make the person a non-Muslim. Then he talked about the Shia and what their views were and where it fell. He, they talked about the, the, the Hashashins and the Ismailis and other people as well. So he, he demarcated that and he demarcated that because it allowed the Khalifa then to recognize who are Muslims who are not Muslims, how to apply Islam in its comprehensive sense, but also to explain that he shouldn't be adopting upon the specific branches of Islam. And historically, that's always been the case. And that's why you've had different madhahibs, different schools of thought, even different schools of Islamic, uh, you know, aqid and theology existing, even though the Khalifa himself would not adopt upon a specific one. There were times when the Khalifa did do that, and there were problems. Like, for example, at the time of Ahmed bin Hanbal, when the Khalifa adopted uh, the Mu'tazila beliefs on the Qur'an being created and that caused issues but generally they stayed away from that. The other point about this issue of does the Khalifa, is he Shia or is he Sunni? Look, historically the Shia believe and it's in there like the Aqidah that only Imam Mahdi can rule. So they've always had this political passivity, yeah, not getting involved. Mm -hmm. And that's because they believe it's haram for them to get into positions of power and that's why the Sunnis, as we'd say, they were able to establish. The real question is, is that for the Shia, is what type of society do they want to live, live under? Do they want to live under an Islamic society, which means the values of Islam, which they agree with and we agree with, are established, whether that is a you know, uh, you know, Sunni or whatever, but that person applies the laws of Islam in its general sense, without trying to you know, uh, uh, you know, enforce a particular madhahib upon the people. And I think generally what you'll find is that general Shia and as well as Sunnis will say yes, this is the type of society we want, a society that respects the Islamic values, the core of the Islamic aqidah of Islam that ensures that people's you know, food, clothing and shelter are being met, that their security is being established. That's what they want and that's what we need to establish. When we start bringing in the discourse of Shia can't be rulers, then you're going to create backs up because their fear is going to be, well, if these people who aren't going to establish the Islamic State come, they're going to oppress us and they're going to cause this problem, they're going to cause that problem, and you create a backlash. And insta instead, you actually politicize them to get involved in the political process, yeah, where it's actually contra contradicts in, in origin their particular beliefs. And I think that's we've been seeing that, haven't we? That's right. Within schism. Iraq. Oh, the schism has always been there. It's just needed somebody to widen that and the, the, be the beautiful saying is that uh, it's easy to divide and rule, isn't it? Let's go back. Uh, Majid, do you have a question? Yeah, I just want to carry on with the previous question, but in you new light. For Brother Mazar again, maybe if you can comment upon sure. the Brother Sharif result, if you can comment on this as well. Um, I mentioned earlier that the word Khilafah has a, you know, a, a bad meaning or a bad term which has been synonymous with you know, terrorism, beheadings and these things. However, recently it's been used by Imran Khan as well. Where in the Dharnas we saw in, in Pakistan in Islamabad, he mentioned, and he mentioned it on other occasions too as well, but he mentioned it specifically this time, so he wasn't scared to use the word. Mm -hmm. um, he said that you know, we need to have a Khilafah like Umar ibn al Khattab. And he also mentioned this issue about you know, Islam is like the Swedish model, uh, the country Sweden. He thinks it's some sort of major ideal. 
and he tries to link this to Islamic rule and the way Islam departs justice and the way the infrastructure is, etc. If you could just comment upon that, I mean, because yeah, I'm just wondering. On one hand, you you are talking from a religious sense what this means, and it means the unification of Muslim countries, and it also means the implementation of Islam. But here's a part, here's a person who has who leads a secular movement. It's not a religious movement in Pakistan. It's secular, but he's not afraid to use the word khilafah to you know mobilize the masses, thinking, look, when I get to power, this is what I'll do. I'm just wondering who his advisors are. But well, anyway, we won't go into that. Do you want to take that on? I mean, he's, he's, I guess he's a wily politician now, Imran Khan. But I think uh, that in itself goes to show that he's using that term because he knows he's got a resonance amongst the I Muslims. I was going to say. So it shows that say. this term, in the Muslim world, maybe in the West they're trying to demonize it, but even now, in the Muslim world, it has a resonance and politicians use it. But we need to define what is an Islamic state. Because like we said, it's, it's been absent for, for the past 90 or so years. Uh, it's not being taught in the schools, it's not taught in the madrasas, it's not taught in the Darul Ulooms. So this knowledge is not uh, in, uh, present in the, the, the masses of the Muslims. So this term, number one, needs to, needs to be clarified. But interestingly, mm -hmm. when, when uh, America bombed um, Iraq, uh, the first Gulf War, which was uh, at the beginning of the 90s, I think 91, 92, when Iraq was bombed by the Americans, uh, when Saddam Hussein was bombed, the professors at SOAS University, they produced a book about the conflict. And it was called about the foundations of the borders and frontiers in the Gulf. And the, it was a very scholarly book looking at the treaties between the Ottomans and the British and this and that. And it talked about in details about the borders. And in one chapter, he had a chapter called Sovereignty. He goes, what is sovereignty? And it's amazing that an academic non-Muslim scholar has a more clear understanding of what is Khilafah than many Muslims themselves. He said in his book that what is the concept of sovereignty? He goes, in, in many nations, the sovereignty is either with the people or with the land, right? Either patriotism or nationalism. He goes, it's in a people or a land. He goes, with Islam, sovereignty is not in the people and it's not in the land. He goes, it's in their religion. That is what is sovereign. So the Khilafah can exist in any place on the earth and any people, black, white, yellow, red, can be the rulers of the Khilafah. And he said, based on this criteria, is Iran an Islamic state? He goes, no, it's not. It's a nationalistic state. Mm -hmm. He goes, is Saudi Arabia an Islamic state? He goes, no, it is a defined nationalistic state which is ruled by a monarchy. He goes, the Islamic state is called a caliphate and it has one ruler called the caliph. So the Islamic Khilafah state is one ruler, it's not a nationalistic state, it's not an eth ethnic state, it's not a sectarian state, it's an Islamic state which expands its border, accommodates people and liberates the people so they can live freely and they can work freely in that land and they can move about in that land. So, you know, we have famous travelers written books in the history where they would travel from Morocco all the way to Afghanistan. No borders, no passports, no visas. So that's why when we open up a land, we call it Fatah. Yeah, Fatah means victory, it means to open up. Because whoever lives in that land, whether you're a Muslim or a non-Muslim, your movement is now liberated. You can move. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the man free, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the earth without borders. It is man who have caged people into little national can you, states. Can you actually see where the challenge of Khalifa would be for present-day capitalist society? No visas. No passport, my goodness. But the thing is, there's actually a parallel because why is it that people ganging up on the Islamic State? You're talking about the First World War and where they had the uh, Triple Entente mm -hmm. when uh, France, uh, Britain and Russia got together because there was a new kid on the block. Germany appeared from nowhere. Because remember, Germany only became a state in 1871. Before 1871, there was no Germany. And within a period of 40, 50 years, it was now challenging the empires of the day. So Britain... France and Russia realized we need to, we need to nip this one okay. in the bud. And that was the cause of World War One. When I come back to that, we're going to take a short break. Don't go away. It's an interesting conversation. You may not believe and you may not agree with what we say, but get involved. Jazakallah khair. See you soon. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to Community Platform. So what does Khilaf actually mean? It has acquired such a negative term. As other words, I have jihad, the veil, um, what does gay being mean, what it meant, you know, 50 years ago, what it means. So that the words take on is evolutionary. But what does it really mean? What does Khilafah really mean? And we'll go back to our audience because we've got some young people who want to grill two of our panelists, and quite rightly, I say two. Yes, I think there was a question from you. Oh, it's from you, young man, is it? Yes. yes. 
My question is relating to us being here in the UK and what I want to ask is like, is it even relevant for us to be discussing this here? Because we d as we all know, we're not talking about overthrowing like the British Parliament or anything. It's, it's about the Middle East and the Muslim world that we're concerned with this Khilafah state. So number one, what influence have we even got here as our voice here in the UK? Because we're a minority here. But number two, we're seeing that recently there's a lot of clamping down, a lot of criminalization of Islam. So whether it's bank accounts being closed, halal meat being discussed as you know uh, in a derogatory manner or whatever it is we see people being detained all these sort of things shouldn't we be focusing on these more that is relevant in this country than the khilafah okay boys you want to take that on but remember time is very short so please respond i can, make, I can make a very brief comment mm -hmm. and then maybe sharif can add, add something to it that why are we talking about something in an arena which is outside the actual arena right so we're talking about islam in the Muslim world and we're here sitting in the West well you could ask that same question to all those anti-apartheid movement activists that were going to Hyde Park and going on the free Nelson Mandela March and the free Nelson Mandela other events that took place you could ask why are you doing that that's over there when you speak it has an impact impact it, it, it words change hearts words change minds and when you create an opinion you can't cage an opinion regardless of where it's created and the same thing about uh, uh, people who worked against apartheid. People around the world worked work against apartheid, and the results came in South Africa. Same with the, 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 the anti-Zionist movements that exist. You know, you had thousands of people in the streets in America, thousands of people in the streets in London and around the world. You know, you could ask the same question to them. Why are you talking about anti-Zionism here when the problem's over there? So, you know, you could say that to anybody. The point is, we are speaking about it because Muslim world is connected. There's a lot of Muslims that live in the West. We are connected to the Muslim world in Pakistan, in, in the Middle East. We, we talk to Muslims here, they talk to their relatives, and it creates an opinion first and foremost. Secondly, you get influential people visiting. They come to hear what we have to say. That makes a difference. And, to be fair, and the, irony of the uh, irony is that here in London, a lot of political movements spoke here in London. Karl Marx was here in London, you know? You had, you even had the Zionist people meeting in Cheatham Hill, you know, in the uh, hundred years ago, talking about the Zionist state. So, you know, London is uh, popular for that, for political discourse. You want to take that question, respond to that? Uh, yeah, I think, uh, uh, you know, the fact is, is we're facing these questions from the wider media and from the wider population. <laughs> Just in my work, I was asked a question about ISIS, you know, and I was asked a question by somebody who works mainly like part-time, She's only, what, 20, 21, saying, is there going to be an attack? What's going to happen? Who are these people called ISIS? And many Muslims will find that they actually face a lot of these types of questions about Sharia law, about the beheading, about Khilafah or Caliphate now, about Jihad. And we've got to be able to understand how to respond. If we don't understand how to respond, then what's going to happen is that they're going to think, well, hold on, this is what Islam represents. And we've got nobody who can actually explain properly what Islam is, truly is. So we've got that responsibility. Secondly, is when we even face problems such as halal meat or Trojan horse or the veil, these things are not disconnected to the discussion what's occurring in the Muslim world. What we're finding is as the Muslims in the Muslim world get closer to establishing a political authority, those people within the power, the power elites within the West, become more and more antagonistic towards Islam. Why? Because they've got to justify from their own population why they want to intervene. So they've got to maybe lower, dehumanize the Muslims, dehumanize their faith, and that means that they start to pick on things like halal meat or Trojan horse or women, etc. To justify to the population why they need to travel thousands of miles with troops, with money, with all of their effort to go and invade another Muslim world or to support dictatorships. So they're saying, look, because they're so, you know, they're so barbaric, we therefore have got to make sure that we break that narrative yeah, as best as possible. And certainly for the Muslim community, that they don't get bought into that narrative as well. That they start to become secularized and accept the change of their deen because you know, they are w w uh, worried or fearful of how the West will react when they start talking about Islam holistically. So the, the fact is, whether we live here, whether we live in the Muslim world, we are affected by the same discourse that's taking place. And we've got to make sure we raise our voice. If we don't, it'll be David Cameron, it'll be you know, Ed Miliband, it'll be these people that'll be raising their voice, it'll be Britain First or EDL that'll be raising their voice, telling the wider population and the Muslim community what Islam is, and we'll be silent.
I think that's something very important that uh, you've touched upon, and I think religious literacy, we need to go back to our books and understand what our faith is. Um, and a lot of people have to play a role, whether it's ulama karam, whether our politician, whether it's our leadership. One last question, because we're really moving into that dangerous period. Make it quick, young man. Final question. So, how does the Khilafah differ in terms of the models that are out there in the world now? For example, the secular liberal values are in either in the West or in the Middle East, or the dictatorships, or the monarchies, or any other basically free will, like let's say in Somalia with no state. So, how does the Khilafah differ in terms of when it comes to the affairs of the people, or in terms of how the economics run? So, how does it like? What's it? How does it majority differ? Well, it's a $6 million question. You've got 30 seconds each to respond. Okay, briefly, Islamic State is very different. Uh, democracy, in, in, uh, democracy is uh, the rule of the people, for the people, by the people. What that means, basically, is the people, in theory, decide what the, role, the rules are, and the people apply the rules over the people. Whereas in Islam, the rules we, d d d we take from the Quran and the Sunnah, and we apply them, and it, we are ruled by the Muslims for the people. Now... The thing is, in Islam, we have accountability of the state. Yeah? So the, the, the Muslims can appoint the Khalifa, and the Muslims can deselect the Khalifa. And this has happened in our history. Right? In democracy, they talk about the same thing. But in practice, in democracy, you put a cross on a piece of paper, and then for five years, you've got to sit down quietly, and they can do virtually what they want. And then five years later, you come and put another cross in the box. Whereas in Islam, you don't have to wait for elections. If the Khalifa steps out of line, you don't have to wait five years. You can dismiss him. And we've got the mechanism in the Khilafah state to do that. So the Khilafah state is the rule of Islam applied on the people. But the people appoint the rulers, and the rulers can only be appointed over the people with consent, which we have this concept of bay'ah. And without that, the Khalifa cannot rule over the people. I just wonder whether that sounds like democracy for some people. Quickly, 30 seconds. Uh, re really quickly, I think one thing we've got to appreciate is that Khilafah is not a utopia. It's not this you know, perfect society. The Khilafah is a political system. It's a way of applying Islamic solutions, which means it's a way of applying the Creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's solutions to human problems. Yeah, that's what we're looking to establish. If we look at and we see that establishment, then we see certain benefits and fruits from that, such as the values of Islam being manifest, the protection of the deen, the protection of life, protection of the mind, protection of lineage. These are the muqasis, these are the goals of Islam that would be manifest. So we have to appreciate that, yes, there will be problems, there will be difficulties, there will be people that might commit criminal acts, there may be corruption, but how are you going to solve these things? How are you going to address these things? From the Khilafah, what that means is we are going to address it from Islam, from the Quran and the Sunnah for a political authority, by the Khalifa who, as uh, Maza said, he's accountable, he's elected, etc. He, uh, he will apply those solutions of Islam. If we don't do that, if we don't establish Khilafah, then what we're going to do is have secular states, have non-Islamic states, trying to think that they can apply better solutions than the solutions that the Quran and the Sunnah, the solutions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given for mankind. Thank you. I'm so sorry, but it's that time when I have to say thank you very much. I've received a lot of text messages. I'm sorry that we cannot respond to your question. But I know that there's an event on uh, Saturday uh, starting at 1.30 in the, I think it's called the um, Plymouth Grove, Manchester Eastern Pearl at 1.30. Go ahead and ask those questions because that's exactly what they're doing. They're talking about what does Khalafa actually mean? Go ahead at 1.30 on Saturday and ask the questions and I'm sure that you'll find some interesting people. The fact is that from my understanding, Khilafa actually is unifying the Muslim communities, not a, a community. I'm very grateful to you, Mazhar Bhai, coming back. Khair. And I know you're a very busy young man. And to you, Sharif. Exactly. And of course, to our young people and my co host Next time, I expect you to be here and not over there. Jazakallah khair for watching and allowing us in your room. And your, um, of course, is always unauthorized um, entry. Join me again next week for another discussion on community platform. Until then, look after yourself and your neighbor, whoever they may be. Assalamu alaikum and khudafis.